three, two, one. Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett of LarkinHospital.tv. We're here for our regular weekly uh, neurosurgical hangout. And today we again have the pleasure of having Richard Mendel. He's a spinal neurosurgeon from Tampa, Florida. And also Richard likes to teach, fortunately. We're also joined by a few uh, prominent uh, panelists. So we'll, we'll introduce them first before we turn it over to Richard. Uh, welcome, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jesse, can you tell a little bit of where you're from and what you're doing, and et cetera? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a second-year student at OUM School of Medicine in Sociana, Um and I'm right in the middle of my curriculum, uh, second year, as I said, and I'm uh, residing in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So welcome, Jesse. Simon? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Simon Downs. I'm a child psychologist and second year medical student at Oceania University of Medicine. And I'm always looking forward to these hangouts. Welcome, Simon. He's an old timer. And yeah. Richard, it's all yours. All right. Let's see. Um, I want to see if you can see the slides. Yeah, update on, on uh, deep, deep brain stimulation. Update on deep brain stimulation. Right. So <clears throat> here, here's some of the recommendations for sources. This, this month, the J Journal of Neurosurgery does a multimedia uh, presentation online, and it's called Neurosurgical Focus. And that's the current issue, June of 2015. And um, then, out of interest, there's a another... Um, good source, and that's the journal, the journal Science. It was uh, June 27th of last year, volume 344, and uh, it was, uh, not pigs, but pages, <laughs> pages 1481 but to 1485. This was just um, um, kind of the explanation for how with the um, prefrontal cortex we actually test um, hypotheses, and, and so that, that was very interesting too for the introduction to the functional neurosurgery. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and, and, and start with the uh, slides. Oh, I'm sorry, these I'm clicking, I need to go to, sorry. All right, so the um, mainstays of deep brain stimulation over the past 15 to 20 years, maybe even 25 years, ha have been uh, focused on Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia. Now, Parkinson's disease and uh, dystonia and tremor, these are the things that Irving Cooper in New York had uh, inadvertently stumbled upon and then did a lot of research on uh, in the uh, 1960s. Um, and Parkinson's disease has been the standard disease that, you know, we hear about in the news, uh, at least laymen do. It's about 20 years now since the um, emergence of, of fetal transplantation by some surgeons in Mexico uh, hit the news and uh, a lot of different implants were talked about 20, 20 to 25 years ago. But this is really what brings us up to the present and I think what's interesting now is what we're going to be looking at um, in, the, uh, in the future. So. These are possible clinical targets for deep brain stimulation. Now, this is, I've got to make this clear, this is not, this is not uh, clinical neurosurgery now. This, a lot of these targets have not been approved yet, but it, it gives you an idea of where some of the basic science research is going. Uh, for instance, um, at Brown University in their department of neurosurgery, there's a, a big emphasis on, on um, functional neurosurgery, especially with uh, 
psychiatric problems, and they're doing a lot of good research there. Um, also, um, Dr. Helen Mayberg's a neurologist at Emory, and she has been working with uh, people that have medically refractory uh, depression and trying to discern whether or not um, there's a role for deep brain stimulation in medically refractory depression. This is a special closed study. I once called her because I, I wanted to go visit. She was just so anxious to, she, she was afraid that I was going to start doing this, I guess, in practice. And, you know, I, I had explained to her that it wasn't, I, I was just interested in it. So um, everybody's pretty closed closed mouth about this, except for, you know, what they're publishing. Now, Kleffster syndrome, uh, you know, that's, that's a... Um, a target, targeted disease for the future, obsessive compulsive disorder, and Tourette syndrome are, are kind of uh, the area in which Kleffster syndrome exists. Also, there's talk about using deep brain stimulation with autism. You know, with autism, we have a really limited insight into what the path pathophysiology of autism is. You know, you hear everybody use the word autistic spectrum disorder, and, you know, um, I'm not sure that's that great a description. You probably ought to use something less labeling, like neurodiversity or something, because you really have no idea. Uh, about the pathophysiology yet, but there is some thought that with deep brain stimulation, you could modulate or regulate some pathways that are dysfunctional now in, in, in the autistic brain and the model that's being proposed. Now, epilepsy has always been uh, another functional problem that um, has been addressed by a great, great many people, including um, 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 Ghazi Yazergil in, in Zurich, and uh, he's been at the, he was at the University of Arkansas, helped getting that Arkansas Neurosciences program off the ground, and um, he even did a lot in the way of. Uh, epilepsy surgery and monitoring in addition to all the vascular neurosurgery did. Um, there are some methods with, uh, with hippocampal mod measurements and, and modulation uh, to improve seizure control of, met of, of really refractory disease. But again, it's, it's um, it's, it's still really in, in a big part, still in the basic science realm. That, but there's, there is some clinical trials being done by Van Gompel, recent article by Van Gompel at the Mayo Clinic. Um, now, in the 1980s, uh, neuropathic pain was a heyday. That was its heyday. Uh, for a deep brain stimulation. Uh, I think because we didn't understand enough uh, at the time and the target wasn't as clear, um, it, it didn't have a high success rate. The chronic neuropathic pain is a, is a big problem worldwide. And it's estimated that 3 to 4 percent of the worldwide population has chronic neuropathic pain. So of course you can see there's Tremendous implications for um, uh, frontal cortical tract stimulation in the future. Now, this is one of the big, the big ones: obesity. Obesity is clearly a target, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But you know, there's tremendous considerations of ethical consideration and. Uh, socioeconomic considerations 
treating obesity with um, deep brain stimulation. Now, this isn't like one of those deals where the girlfriend says, oh, does this dress look, make me look fat? This is like morbid obesity in people who have already failed behavioral modi modifications. And, uh, and um, you know, this isn't just a go-to um, instead of bariatrics. I mean, the bariatrics is fine, but has considerable risk, considerable side effects, tremendous endocrinological problems, and um, nutrition problems. Um, before um, hypothalamic stimulation and lateral thalamic stimulation is considered, there's going to be a, need to be a lot more done in the way of not only the basic science, but also the the ethics of, uh, of using uh, deep brain stimulation for obesity. Um, <clears throat> sorry. All right, so one of the issues with and of course, it's an important ethical issue, is how safe is deep brain stimulation? You know, basically, the deep brain stimulation is, is really achieved by using what is basically a pacemaker. Uh, and I think at, at this time, Medtronic has clearly uh, been involved in this from such a long time ago, they, they pretty much have a, a jump on quite a few of the um, other people involved, or other companies involved, but I'm not, I'm not promoting any, any one company, but um, um, basically what you have is a pacemaker connected to a uh, micro-stim lead, and so, you know, we know that the pacemakers have proved incredibly reliable. What what is quote widely incident in uh, deep brain brain stimulation, especially really in Parkinson's disease patients, is uh, a post op psychosis that often can develop months to years after after implantation. But the uh, incidence and in, in the clinical risk factors really aren't borne out to be statistically significant, with the exception of a correlation, a correlation of older age at first implantation. So, you know, an older person undergoing implantation late in life does seem to have a, an increased correlation with uh, post-op psychosis. Um, but other than that, there's really not not any clear uh, uh, clear indication of of a predictive value yet on um, who will develop what is really the uh, major side effect of uh, DBS. Um, Okay, so you know things things have become so much more. Uh, technology's come so far since I was in medical school. I'm going to show you something. This is the um, I don't know if you guys hear much about this in neuroanatomy, but this is the ACPC line, and that's the anterior commissure and posterior commissure of the third ventricle, and um, now we can measure things so precisely that microelectrodes can be implanted in incredibly difficult places. And you'll see that in a few minutes. But what you're looking at here are, are different nuclei within the thalamus. And this is how, how we used to plot um, nuclei when I was a medical student. 
um, I think Dr. Bennett, you'll remember, the first CAT scanners were called EMI scanners, EMI, uh, right? Yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So EMI Henry Henry Schenken of Philadelphia. Yeah. So EMI scanners were named after the music company EMI, and uh, um, they were the first distributors of CTs in the U.S. and I think Great Britain. Right. But um, you know, it was kind of a weird coupling because you had all these like music industry people selling Emmy scanners. You know, yeah. it was crazy. Yeah, Paul Mc Paul McCartney was part owner of that. Yeah, uh, and Emmy uh, Emmy had the rights to the Beatles for a long time, I think. So so Very anyway, the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure are markings that you can clearly see. On ventriculography, which is, you know, long since had its heyday, but on a CAT scanner or, or at the time an EMI scanner, there was a ball, and that ball was like a track ball, like you would think of now with computers, and that track ball wouldn't roll, wouldn't roll smoothly, it would click, and. What we used to do to target the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure, <laughs> they say that the, the target is like 12 and a half millimeters back, and you know, at the time I thought it was eight to ten clicks, but I think now it's six millimeters laterally, right? Mm -hmm. The way we measured it was clicks. Now the clicks weren't correlated or scientifically validated, but we would say we do 12 to 13 clicks back and 6 to 8 clicks or 10 clicks lateral and that's that's where we would make the mark on the CT scan. You know, it wasn't really uh, all that precise. Now things are, are just much more precise and the idea that we used to do that is kind of like horrifying now, but we didn't have this technology. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is one of the one of the targets that's used. But in a minute, um, this this is um, this is really very elegant. This is the study by Van Gompel uh, out of the Mayo Clinic: deep brain stimulation for epilepsy uh, and the developments that have gone on. The anterior nuclear deep brain stimulation is is um, guided by a by concordant, you know, simultaneous hippocampal recording. So, what what's happening here is we're able to monitor a nuclei that was so sequestered in the past that you could really not hit it reliably. So, what happens is part of the the nuclei is covered by the ventricular system, so um, it's very hard to hit. But now, using uh, modern monitoring off of the hippocampus, you can do a um, like a uh, electronically guided um, placement into this anterior nuclear uh, area. And there have been reports now of really significantly, like greater than 50% uh, diminishment of um, the severity of seizures in, in a medically and prior surgically refractory population. That's really very impressive. Um, now, this is where tremendous amount of the controversy comes in is with obesity. Obesity, as you can see, is a, it's a complex process. You know, leptins are really felt to stimulate appetite, and um, there's some suspicion that there have been um, leptins incorporated into genomes so that, you know, get increased uh, consumption of some foods. And that's what a lot of people worry about. Um, but anyway, the, the ventral thalamic area, the nucleus accumbens, the lateral hypothalamus, the, there's a um, 
synchronicity here between underactivation, hyperactivation of the nucleus accumbens in the lateral hypothalamus, and and a um, um, direct opposite hypoactivation of the prefrontal cortex. And the thought is that with in the satiety centers, what we're dealing with is an imbalance between the prefrontal cortex and the lateral aspects of the uh, hypothalamus. And so the question now is, um, can we find a good dependable medium between food stimulus, intake, satiety, and, um, and, and hunger? Um, you know, dopamine plays a large role in the in the pathway. But again, there's a lot that needs to be figured out. I mean, the um, the ethical considerations are, you know, what why why we're applying why we, you would want to apply the brain stimulation to what is a maladaptive behavior, but by the same token, there are a lot of people now that are obese who have family members that there's no history of obesity. And so maybe there's more to this than mal just maladaptive behaviors. Uh, maybe there is a trending issue with the, um, with the um, um, equilibrium between hypo and hyperactivation and maybe this is something that's fixable because treating treating the patient's end organs i.e. bariatric surgery uh, has a great deal of risk to it and um, it's not an ideal treatment you, you know you're rerouting a lot of nutri nutrients and uh, um, with the increasing amount of obese obesity, there's an increasing amount of diabetes, and clearly, um, you know, if this could be treated centrally in a safer fashion, that would be really interesting. Um, we're really quite a ways away from this, though. I, I, you know, it, this is studied very well in, in lab rats, and, you know, you get to see some aspects of the problems in the hypothalamic area in children who, for instance, have craniopharyngiomas that really disturb the hypothalamic tract, and they can just be, they can get just so incredibly obese from uh, um, the effects of the tumor and um, just uh, increased eating. Uh, it's almost as a... a obsessive syndrome with them. Um, um, but, you know, you'll see that in these children that develop particularly craniopharyngiomas. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this is what I was referring to earlier. In the 80s, that was kind of the heyday for uh, deep brain stimulation for neuropathic pain. Um, in the 80s, things for a while were quite liberal in terms of um, uh, indications for, for trying to uh, control neuropathic pain. Now, we have learned so much since in neuroscience since 1985 to 1989 when I was in medical school. It's just, un it's mind-boggling. But um, um, we understand a lot more about pain. And, you know, this is not a treatment for um, acute pain. Clearly it's a, a chronic neuropathic pain. And, you know, I think when you look back, the first successful singulotomies were in a population of, of women with 
really widely metastatic breast cancer, and they were writhing in pain, miserable. Uh, this is an end of life, and um, what was done was that um, this singular tract was was um, um, cut on both sides on both both hemispheres through a very close to midline burr hole on, on each side of the sagittal sinus. And it didn't cure the chronic pain. It didn't cure the, the pain. But it, it really kind of made the women indifferent to the pain. Um, um, so that, that was the first indication that we really uh, we really needed to direct some thought to the singular area for uh, controlling this kind of chronic pain. Um, over the recently, there have been developments in in treating some pain syndromes, but you know, pain is very complex. You can see by this diagram all the path, the uh, stops and pathways of um, you know pain centers including the thalamus, the insula, uh, basal ganglia and um, the periaqueductal gray area in particular near the um, central canal of the brainstem and cord but um, you know these are areas that are really going to be in I think in wide use in a decade to a decade and a half from now. And I, I think we're going to uh, really be able to much more effectively control things that we never really thought we would get control of uh, so soon. The idea that, um, that as we get, as we learn more about um, psychiatry and the real uh, pathophysiology of the disease, um, we may be able to modulate things much better than than we ever dreamed of uh, a short time ago. Uh, this isn't a you know a knock on psychiatry. It's really it's a great advance because you, you know we're being able to measure and monitor areas of activation and inactivation of functional MRI, PET, and everything else. And I think the only thing that's holding us really back is we don't know enough yet about the diseases themselves. So, you know, coin that, that term autistic spectrum disease, they're, they're, that may be a tremendously wide spectrum that includes all kinds of, uh, of uh, permutations of imbalances. So I think as we get better at that, we'll be able to treat it. But until you can really measure something, you know, you can't fix it until you understand what's wrong. But it may be that, that things like activating um, dysfunctional pathways bear some uh, hope for kids with um, autism. You know, when I was in medical school, we would talk about the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum as though they were just an interesting artifact that didn't do anything, like they were a deciduous organ, like in a, like the appendix. But you know now you, there's seems to be a tremendous correlation between abnormal Purkinje cells and the severity, or, or at least a you know correlation w with the severity of autism and things like that. So you know clearly we didn't have have as good an understanding then as technology is letting us letting us uh, look into now. Um, now again, a lot of really great centers are working on things like this. The, um, I think the obesity is being done, a lot of work is being done at Stanford on that. The Mayo Clinic has done a lot with um, that dorsal anterior stimulation for epilepsy. Um, there's a, a lot of great developments, but these are just not clinically available yet, obviously, and uh, I don't want 
I don't want to imply that this is endorsed by the uh, FDA or anything like that. These are just some uh, uh, projects that look like there's a lot of promise in the future to get um, to get control of. Uh, I think that should be. Yeah, that was it. Um, oh, let me close this a minute. Um, any, is there any questions I can uh, try to answer for you? I mean, I, I don't have the answers, but I read all about them today. <laughs> okay. I, okay, Richard, thank you very much. Uh, you thank need you. to get off, get off the screen share. Just click on that green arrow and you're on your screen, and that takes you off the screen share. So we can see see okay. you. There you go. Yeah, yeah, Richard. You know, I know inherently there's a problem with doing clinical trials with brain uh, procedures because I myself, as an emergency physician, had to try to get volunteers to 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 take thrombolytics for strokes. Yeah. yeah. For strokes, and that was a tough sell to talk yeah. to a patient and a family about being, you know, on the forefront of experimental. Neuro, neurosurgery and neurology. Yeah. So uh, it's inherently difficult doing trials on epileptics, Parkinsonism patients. Um, are, are they actually doing trials on, on patients now in those areas in, um, in uh, deep brain stimulation? Well, you know? there are people that are have you know special uh, clearance for uh, enrolling some patients that are like in the epilepsy, uh, I'm sorry, in the depression program, these are patients that have already failed every other known therapy. Right. And so um, I know that Dr. Mayberg was working with, with some terribly depressed patients. Now, I was just interested in seeing, I didn't, you know, uh, I didn't get to see it, but, you know, it's so hush-hush that, you know, we don't want to just... We don't want to create any false, false hope. Yeah. False hopes right now because yeah. there's things that aren't going to be available in the immediate future. But you can, you know, there's very few things that we're good at predicting in medicine. Like, I'll give you an example. Who would have thought that five years ago, the hot topic in medicine would be fecal transplant and you know biomimers. Yeah. Of, mm -hmm. of, of the intestinal the tract. Yeah. And so, but I, I, I would be surprised if we're not doing tremendous work in stimulation of the brain it, in our, our lifetimes, you know, and, and, and surgery will change a lot. I mean, I think we'll still be doing tumor surgery, we'll still be doing a lot of stereotactic radio surgery, trauma. But I think that functional neurosurgery is just going to become more applicable, not not just because of technology, but um, well, principally because of technology, but just because we learned so much more. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we didn't do it. <laughs> you know, the compendium of knowledge just got better and better as the technology. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Lisa and Jesse uh, and Simon, do you have a question or comments? Um, may I? Okay, Lisa first. Okay. Um, just wanted to share that when I went up to Vancouver last summer to tour a medical center there, they were able to do a lot more clinical trial-like things uh, just because of the structure of their medical system. Um, I uh, I want to be careful, okay? So I'm just going to say a couple things. We used to have a great meeting in spine surgery by um, a fellow at Rochester who used to have a spinal technology meeting every year, and it was typically done at Whistler Black Home in in uh, British Columbia because we could see what the rest of the world was using outside of the US. We didn't, we, you, can't, you can't show those things at a meeting inside the United States. So you want to 
always look at the technology that other people are using worldwide. And I, I, um, I, I don't want to besmirch anyone's dignity. I'm not that great an enthusiast for our medical delivery system. So I think that I, I should really shut up about the FDA. But I'm not, I'm not saying to do anything off-label. I'm just saying that... Um, uh, well, you know, Richard, in these digital days, we certainly can't ignore work in stem cells that's being done in China and Korea. Uh, and these are areas where they're doing a lot more than the U.S. because of legal and ethical situations. We can't turn a blind eye to that. No, uh, but you also have to worry because there has been so much falsification of data over right, the last couple right, of years that right. science, you know, if you let all these corporate entities get too involved and you have all this uh, fraudulent work being done, science is going to take on the allure of, um, you know, the psychic network on UHF TV. Right. Because, you know, so many, it's sad, but so many Americans have no, no interest in science at all. They're so easily fooled and goaded into things like raspberry ketones that Dr. Oz is slinging. Right. It, it, it's ridiculous. Like, somebody sent me a video of a neurosurgeon in Italy who's proposing to do a head transplant yeah. on a, 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 a 29 or 30 year old with Wernick Hoffman's disease. Right. Wernick Hoffman's disease, I've never seen anybody live past 10 months with that. So wow. first of all, I doubt very highly he has Wernick Hoffman's disease because he wasn't on a ventilator. And, um, and the idea that he's going to transplant a head is ridiculous. I mean, he was asked how he would do an anastomosis between the medulla and the spinal cord, and he was talking about using glue. Glue. Now, I mean, it's terrible that lay people um, are this this disinterested in, in science, you know, when they're believing this guy's really going to do a head yeah. transplant, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, in a way, Richard, I, I think that we can help in that respect as being physicians. We can kind of help, like you're doing now, like you help clearing, clearing yeah, up, but, clearing up the garbage, and saying, yeah, but, wait, "Wait a minute, you know, don't be oh, too quickly uh, accepting of of these trials, whatever." Yeah, but there's a big disconnect with that, and and you guys will see this, and Simon. I'm sure you know this, and John, you know this, but. Um, oh, and you being an RN definitely know this. Look, you know, when somebody will come into the office with you, and you know the way the healthcare system is now, you have so little time to spend with these patients. Like, I try to spend time with them because I'm a surgeon, I want them to be confident. But, you know, you start getting grilled by fam well intentioned family members about things they've gotten usually from the internet right. and then you're stuck in a catch-22 where you're trying to explain to somebody without any real foundations in science you're trying to explain medicine to them like you're teaching you're trying to teach somebody with no fundamentals what's going on so I always get I always get uh, somewhat interested when attorneys will ask if I've given the patient informed consent. So I explain everything to the attorney and they almost never understand it and I have them repeat it back and I say, well look, I did the best I could. You know, these people are don't have a great fund of knowledge and you being a lawyer certainly are going to have a lot less than they will. So, no, I mean I'm not able to transmit all this knowledge that it took me years to get to somebody with Little, you know, little insight. They may be very smart. They're just not uh, that well attuned to science. So, it, it, you know, it's hard. It's hard mm -hmm. to explain difficult, you know, things that are difficult to explain to a colleague who may be in a different specialty 
and you're trying to explain it to a layman who's watching Dr. Oz cure obesity with raspberry ketone drinks. Right. right. You know, it's it's not it's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's very right. difficult. Crazy. Uh, Jesse, uh, do you have any questions of Richard uh, or comments? Turn off your mute, Jesse. I don't have any questions at this time. Thank oh, you. Okay, Jesse. How about you, Lisa? Uh, yes, I was wondering if the deep brain stimulation has been effective for drug addiction, alcohol addiction. Well, that, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Recently in, in science, there have been discussions about um, newer pathways and more effective ways of blocking uh, the pathways of addiction. You know, we don't, we don't have a great idea, uh, uh, a consolidated model of addiction yet. There's tremendous variations, and uh, th that's been a, a hot topic, but that's still in the basic science realm. I, uh, you know, the biggest thing I've seen recently uh, in the last year or two is this blossoming of the use of Suboxone and I, I really don't have a good feel for how effective that is. Mm -hmm. um, it, it kind of reminds me of methadone. You know, the, everybody's taking Suboxone but they, they're still addicted and just the way you will often see somebody who's addicted to heroin, you know, that they're, they're still using heroin plus going to the methadone. Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm not I don't think we have many answers yet. I, I, I need to brush up on on the new the new developments. I've been reading about it in science, but I, I don't see that that's going to be, you know, clinically applicable anytime soon. Um, addiction's a tough tough issue. Yeah. Did, did you did you guys ever? Did you guys have, you heard of the Harrison Narcotics Act, didn't you? In mm. 1914. Yeah, can you refresh our memories? Yeah. I've heard of it, but not. Uh... You're, you're going to love this. This is a great. This is a great story. In in 1914, the Harrison Narcotics Act was enacted by the federal government, and you know what would be your guess as to why it was enacted? I mean, you you all have different. Uh, uh, I know it had something to do with narcotics. Yeah. Well, here's here's what it was. Everybody thinks today that it was the government um, trying to protect the safety of citizens from uh, opioids, right? But at that time, we really didn't know anything about opioids other than it, they caused constipation. At the same time, you know, people were smoking, and we knew there was some correlation with lung problems, but, you know, we didn't know that opioids were any worse for you or any better for you than tobacco. You know, opioids kind of an unusual choice. You know why opioids got chosen? What is that? Um, in the 1800s, particularly the 1850s on, uh, we, we, we built our railroads, but we really didn't build them. We just imported migrant workers from China, Asia, but mostly China to build the railroads, right? And so we weren't importing women. We were importing, obviously, men. And a lot of the guys would send back to family members once they had enough money. But what was happening in the West after about 1899 to 1900, all the railroads were built. So now we had all this influx of Asian workers who had done everything they were asked to do. And they were congregating in the bigger cities in the West, particularly San Francisco. And people grew concerned about the risk of the chastity of white women from, um, from uh, uh, Asian mongrels. It was all racially motivated. And so an easy way to disperse the Asians was to outlaw opium because a lot of the guys would hang out in, quote, opium dens, which weren't illegal, and we didn't know that, that opium was such a tough disease. We just wanted to disperse Asians, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't motivated to protect citizens from a, a bad drug. Um, so, you know, 
it's just another, it's just a, a, a kind of a funny story. It was a racially motivated law. That's an interesting. It's like a Jim Crow law. Well, you know, going back to deep brain stimulation, uh, Richard, it's made inroads in, epile in, in, in Parkinsonism, as you mentioned, uh, more than any other disease, correct? Well, you know, I, th I think, I, I would say movement disorders, you know, of okay. which Parkinsonism is one, but, you know, we're good with treating the movement component, the tremor component of Parkinson's disease. The problem is that not all Parkinson's disease is the same, and some of the Parkinson's patients are what we call bradykinetic or slow. And those patients that are very bradykinetic um, have a much, much lower success rate than, than control of tremor. Mm -hmm. So we're good at the at dystonia, essential tremor, um, the um, Parkinsonism where there's a significant motor component. But when there is a, a paucity of movement, uh, we're not that good at it. Epilepsy, uh, I think epilepsy is going to be much more, you know, in epilepsy we have um, over the last 65 to 70 years from Rasmussen and, and the water pen field at the Montreal Neurological Institute, they got tremendously successful in resecting portions of the brain. Right. But now, instead of resecting portions of the brain, I think we'll be able to functionally adjust them to control seizures. And, and that's actually what they're trying to do with um, it in the Mayo Clinic model. And Dr. Yazergill, who's really known for his expertise in aneurysm surgery, used to have a really uh, elegant way of placing electrodes for um, depth electrode placement for epilepsy monitoring. Most residents, when they hear depth electrode placement, which we don't do that much anymore, um, it makes it, you know, a chill run up and down their spine. But shudder. But Dr. Dr. Yazergill used to place, instead of placing many electrodes into the hippocampus from front to back, what Dr. Yazergill would do, they would go perpendicular to the hippocampus. Dr. Yazergill had this technique where he would spear the hippocampus through an occipital burr hole and monitor the length of the hippocampus. So, you, you know, that, that was a... a kind of a unique way of doing things. I think there's, you know, epilepsy is uh, an electrical phenomenon. So that that should be something we might, may be able to really address because well, we know we know a lot about it, but well, you never know. Well, you know, coming from a, a relatively uneducated neurosurgical mind uh, and knowing that from trauma you can get epilepsy, as you know, I would think it would be almost a pretty structural problem. If you just get to the structure, you can fix it. Yeah, but you know what? Think about this because, you know, this is, this is the example I always think of. When I was finishing residency, everybody was talking about um, stem cells. And, and, you know, in all the time, since um, since that the whole thing got started, stem cells so far haven't borne out. There's a lot of answers, but not answers that we can put together. Yeah. Um, but common. who would think that a disease like cystic fibrosis would be like the ideal genomic target? Or, you know, because it's a one gene deletion. Right, right. right. Not we organic. haven't really made any advances from a genomic standpoint in curing cystic fibrosis. But kids with cystic fibrosis are living longer. But I just think it's because so many pulmonologists knock their brains out, and researchers knock their brains out. But it's not because we were genetically able to splice in one gene, one gene. You know, right. but so uh, I, there's there's a lot more to genetics than just and my last name is Mendel, yellow, green, round, <laughs> wrinkle. There's a lot more to it than that. And I think everybody's inventing the new field of epigenetics is just all the stuff that 
we didn't figure out yet. So, you know, it's still right. genomics. Okay, very good. Um, any more questions, Simon? Uh, I mean, yes, I have one. Go ahead, go ahead Simon. Um, thank you for your very interesting lecture. I, I learned a lot as usual, and one of the reasons I'm interested in in uh, neurosurgery is well, because personal experience growing up. Um, in England, I had absent seizures when I was a child, and um, and I, what I called was shakes yeah. in the middle of the night. And then my father had full uh, tonic-clonic seizures, and I used to often get EEGs growing up, and um, became interested in in psychology and medicine. And you know, as a psychologist, I take care of of, of my clients who some of them are very very depressed, some of them cannot move at all. Right. And it's very, it's impossible to understand how they feel. It's really impossible for anybody yeah. who's not in that position to understand how they feel. So I became interested in what well, you were talking about, the, the deep brain stimulation and the brain pacemaker. So my first question is, how does that brain pacemaker work, the pulse? Well, that? that's, that's a good point. And that, that is really nicely covered in Von Gompel's article from the Mayo Clinic in that neurosurgery focus because they talk about the length of stimulation, voltage, and a number of permutations, and none of those seem to correlate with the uh, incidence of postoperative psychosis. And um, it's not clear, but you know, we're not, we're not honing in on, on a uh, specific defect. We're just trying to grossly jumpstart a dysfunctional oh, pathway. So we don't, we really don't know yet. Just if I it mean, works, it works. All the things that we think are insurmountable are just because we're not that smart. You know, okay. I, I can remember, you know, these primates, these chimpanzees. You know, everybody would make fun of chimpanzees, but they were smarter than most of us. I mean, they could draw, they could draw repetitive patterns. You'd show them something, and if you offered them a reward, they would just very blasely reproduce your movement and in a way I couldn't even do. So, you know, we just don't ha have enough insight, but yeah. you're right. I mean, think of all the synapses. There's like three trillion synapses between your billions of neurons, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and one thing that neuro neuroscientists always say is you can't change one thing without changing everything. And that's, that's true. So the idea that, yeah, I mean, the idea that, uh, you know, you can empathize and know exactly what somebody's feeling that has an emotional mm -hmm. or physical disorder, it mm -hmm. may all be physical disorders and right. it may all be uh, intracranial. Right. So who well, knows? Maybe that, so that leads into my second question in that as a, as a psychologist, I'm working in my uh, university in my, in my program that was seeing uh, uh, clients, children all together in a room and they were said that some were autistic, some had Asperger's and some had this this newly named, what I call, well, relatively newly named PDD-NOS, which is oh, pervasive de developmental disorder, not that's, otherwise specified. That's, <laughs> flipped, that's flipped around. That You're in Japan, right? Yes. Yeah, because, see, what happened was, if you look back five or six years ago, PDD-NOS, pervasive yeah. developmental disorders, not otherwise specified, was getting coded so much that mm -hmm. it was ridiculous. So yeah. at some point, somebody applied that autistic spectrum disorder to mm -hmm. PDD. So PDD kind yeah. of disappeared here, and then now everybody talks about autistic spectrum disease. And you know. Know what? we don't really, I mean, what we're calling autistic That's... spectrum disease, there are kids clearly with autism, Mm -hmm. But there are also these kids that I, I would much, I think you ought to term them like neurodiverse, not mm -hmm. otherwise specified, rather yeah. than labeling them, because of the exact same reason of you and your father. You had these petite mal seizures, right? And your dad had full-blown seizures. And, and we didn't know, we didn't understand epilepsy as as well in the past, obviously, but... Um, everybody worked things up the way they thought it should be done. And I, I have a friend of mine, 
she's my age now, and I remember when she was young, I think she had only ever had one or two absence seizures, and she got stuck on Dilantin for decades and has okay. all the facial all the facial stigmata of somebody mm -hmm. that was on um, I see on that for years and I, you know nowadays I, it was funny a friend called me about a year ago because the child had had a, a seizure and and you know now we treat things so differently. Not not everybody is on chronic long-term dilantin. The EEGs are, are are good. It's a measurement, but you mm -hmm. know, and and the thing was, most of those kids that had one or two seizures never had another seizure again. They didn't need a decade. Yeah, there were a lot of medicine. people who come to my center that shouldn't be there. Yeah, but diagnosed with this and that, and yeah, please, but, a little bit of parent but, training. You know, the thing is. Like, this is like I told you before. I'm not, like, seizures, it doesn't surprise me. Seizures don't surprise me. What surprises me is why we don't have more seizures. I mean, it's 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 a short circuit. It's an electrical mm -hmm. dysfunction. And it's, I think it's fascinating how rare seizures really are in, in the scheme of things. Because it's like I told you with, with that really laminar paper-like bone in the middle of the year. It's so close to an artery that you would think that people would hear throbbing throbbing of that artery all the time, but they don't. Somehow it's modulated out. And you don't, Maybe we can hear it and somehow it gets modulated out, but there's so many things that are that don't happen as much as you think they would. Mm -hmm. That's amazing, too. Do you think that when we get to in brain mapping down to one to the one micron level, some of the answer, these questions will be answered? I think by then we'll have another another uh, magnitude of order that. that oh, so I see. Far, you know, I, I I don't think we're I don't think we're that much smarter than primates. You know, uh, than other primates. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think we tell ourselves stories to make us feel better, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure. I agree. We're, with that that advance, mm -hmm. well, well, we'll work at it. It gives us something to do. Yeah, <laughs> nothing better to do. Well, you're just a side note, Richard. You know the, and we could get involved. This is a side issue about genomics and dilantin. It's been proven that some people are not, uh, because of their uh, genetic genetic profile, they're not affected by dilantin at all. It's like giving them yes. some sugar. Th that's true. You know, but th that's been done for a lot of drugs so far. Showing whether your um, uh, P450 system w will be properly regulated by what statin. I, I know that. I, I, I'm not even sure half these drugs are that efficacious anyway. But, yeah, I'm going to give you one other example, and that is you know, we have no idea, or we had no idea at the time about electroconvulsant therapy and what it did. We just used it. 50, 60 years ago because it did work. And all you have to do is ask some of these patients that were chronically had unipolar depression if the ECT worked. And it, it definitely did. So even though we don't know what we're doing, sometimes sometimes you just have to use what works. And well, you, know, you know, Richard, I feel the same way about my computer. <laughs> if it's not working, I just reboot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, anyways, Richard, I'd like, like to thank you very much. We could go on forever. With you're such an interesting guy. With well, the what do you guys want to do next? I mean, mm -hmm. the functional stuff's very interesting. We can talk about obesity pathways or addiction pathways, mm -hmm. but um, you know, maybe what we could do is um, what you, you know what I'll do. We'll talk about why don't we talk about glioblastomas next week? Because okay. that's a uh, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's somewhere where we have had such limited success. It's unreal. It's incredible. Well, you know, Richard, we're having one tomorrow in Spanish on glioblastomas oh. with, with a neurosurgeon from from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. All right. Well, I'll just translate it. Well, yeah. Well, I I, I don't know. If no, no. I'll uh, speak Spanish. I, but you know, one thing I want to show you after the show, Richard. Uh, well, I'll talk to you after the show. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to sign off, and thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, Jesse, and thank you very thank much, you. Simon.
So signing off. Okay.